Hello. Hello. Hello to you. Hello. So, uh, Paranipolis was a concept invented, invented by one Czech dissident during Czechoslovakia uh, in the late in the late seventies. It was a dictatorship uh, regime in Czechoslovakia in that time, and most dissidents and most people who were against communist regime realized that it's not possible in that time to make any strike, any demonstration to change this political system in, uh, in this time. Uh, and at, at, in, the, in the late uh, 70s, there was one guy called Václav Benda, a Czech guy, and he, and he wrote something like Parallel Police Manifesto. That's exactly why we decided to use this name. And Parallel Police Manifesto was a manifesto uh, when he declared that it's possible that we, sh that we should ignore dictatorship regime like communist people and we should try to create pearl society, we should try to create pearl culture, we should try to create uh, pearl free markets, uh, also pearl legal system. Uh, unfortunately, uh, technically his manifesto has never been uh, implemented in practice and it takes another 20 years until the beginning of beginning of 90s that some people in, especially in California Silicon Valley people around Intel company for cypherpunks they realized potential of crypto because at this time the first implementation of PGP was released. And exactly at this time, there was a visionary called Timothy Sime who predicted future. Uh, he predicted bitcoins, he predicted a lot of new technologies because he realized the potential of, of crypto and how crypto could significantly change our future. So, so he wrote Crypto Anarchist Manifesto and also he wrote a Crypto uh, Anarchistic uh, text which is called Cyphernomica. It's exactly this text why I personally uh, became anarcho-capitalist, why I revealed there is something like Austrian Economic School and, and exactly this, te this text completely changed my life. So now it's my honor to introduce you introduce you this special special uh, man called Timothy Simai. Uh, hello Timothy. It's your hello, turn. Martin. Yes, uh, I'm Tim May. I bring this to you from uh, California. That's uh, the mountains outside, Santa Cruz Mountains, we just had a wildfire a few days ago. Still burning, I think, uh, between Santa Cruz and Silicon Valley. It doesn't affect my house, but uh, it's certainly a wake-up call. So I moved out here 30 years ago. I left Intel in 1986 and uh, uh, for various reasons. And then I spent about a year sitting on the beach here in Santa Cruz, reading novels, reading technical papers, reading books. It took me almost a, a complete year to uh, get back into really high gear on technical things. And about a year after I moved out here, a friend of mine put me in touch with a guy doing a thing called an information market. This is the American Information Exchange, which was later bought by AutoCAD and uh, eventually folded after a couple of years. Uh, the, the main guy doing it, Phil Salen, an Austrian economics guy who had met Friedrich Hayek Murray Rothbard, etc. He died of cancer and the project sort of ended. But the idea was six or eight years before eBay, which also started 
here in the Bay Area. Uh, his idea was to buy and sell information on the internet. The internet was just getting rolling at that time. Access was very primitive. We had to dial up into CompuServe, whatnot. By the end of 1988, we had actual private internet accounts. Ironically, I had an, a primitive account on the ARPANET in 1973. And I mean, talk about slow. This is uh, stroke written tectronics displays, refresh displays about 100 millimeters uh, diagonally. And we, it took us a long time to get anything from one campus to another. But Phil's idea was to create information markets that would allow people to say, uh, people would say, I will be willing to pay $100 for an article on the best sailboat to buy. So a friend of mine, a guy who later, who also was bought by AutoCAD, did a company called uh, Habitat, which was, uh, uh, he was the inventor of the term avatar, the little, little creatures that run around and, and buy and trade and talk and whatnot. So Chip, Morningstar, put me in touch with Phil. And I went over to Phil's house in late December 1987, I think it was. Yeah, 1987. And he told me about his idea to buy and sell information, things like the best surfboard to buy, the best sailboat, whatnot. And being a sort of a devious person who just read True Names and was heavily immersed in a lot of this uh, science fiction snow crash at the time that was about to come out, I said, you know, Phil, the, the real market for people buying and selling information is not going to be things like what's the best sailboat to buy. It's going to be proprietary corporate information. It's going to be what's the best PM plant dose on, a, on an NMOS uh, transistor, meaning secret information, pharmaceutical information, corporate information. This is the stuff that's really valuable. And he said, well, you know, then we won't allow people to access this from at work. And I said, well, then people just go home, log on to their AOL account, and buy and sell their corporate secrets. This could be pharmaceutical information, troop movement information, somebody sitting in, in, a, in an apartment in San Francisco watching ships going in and out, classic spy stuff. He said, well, then uh, we'll trace it by their names. He said, well, then they'll use pseudonyms. I said, well, that can still be traced. And I said, well, I don't think so. Here's why. And I remembered vaguely a paper I'd read, written, I, excuse me, I'd read the previous year in Communications of the American Association for Computing Machinery by a guy named David Schaum, you may have heard, P-A-U-M. And I, I went home and I dug through my old journals and I found it. It was transaction systems to make Big Brother obsolete or, or similar things. And he discussed digital money of his form. He later had a company called DigiCash. Dining photographers net, zero knowledge systems, things which really blew my mind. Uh, I'd known of Ravesh Shamir and Edelman RSA system and I'd met Martin Hellman and Whit Diffie because they're local to uh, the Bay Area. So I'd, I'd read all the stuff on this, but this really got me fired up to, to investigate modern techniques of cryptography. And uh, I read all I could in the, in the next couple of days, and then I went back over to uh, over the hill to Silicon Valley, and I met with Phil again, and I said, well, here's how this can be done. This can be done using uh, techniques of anonymity, mixes, digital remailers, etc. And in a couple of days, it, it became pretty clear to me that these things were out and about in the academic community and could probably be implemented in software on the then nascent internet. So I met with him and his partners for several, several more meetings. And I did, proposed a thing I called BlackNet. And I later about 1993 or 94, I implemented this using PGP, implemented a, a toy version of it. I quickly confessed after about two weeks that I was the author of BlackNet because I didn't want to get arrested. I, I wanted to show a proof of concept that one could create a, a kind of version of the Chinese democracy wall. This is very big in 1988, 89, the idea that people could, in Beijing, could go down to a wall and, excuse me, 
and write things on the wall that were essentially anonymous and untraceable, saying meet me or leave a message, leave a reply. It was crystal clear that this was what David Shalom's digital mixes from 1982 provided. So I was talking to a friend of mine, and uh, Martin mentioned 1968 is an important year. Well, indeed, that's the year that I read a very important novel for me, namely Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. I don't recommend it. It's not a very good novel, but it was highly influential to, to me as a 16-year-old. This is the average age that people read Atlas Shrugged and are struck by it. And you see references to it in the recent movie Snowden, where Snowden admits to reading Atlas Shrugged early on. And his handler at the CIA even quotes lines from Atlas Shrugged. So in around February 1988, I was talking to another friend of mine who basically said, you know, it's too bad that Ayn Rand's old ideas from 1955 or thereabouts were never properly implemented with technology. She had this idea that uh, the anarcho-capitalists of the world, she hated the term anarcho-capitalist because it suggested anarchy, which she did not like, but that's the origins of modern libertarianism. And as Martin said, lots of many, many other political philosophies of the time. Nietzsche, you know, uh, of course, was a heavy influence on this. So it occurred to my friend and I that we could use modern technology. And I was telling him about uh, cryptography techniques and saying, essentially, Galt's Gulch, this idea of this valley in Colorado, that's a western state in the U.S., which was somehow covered over with some electronic shield. He didn't describe how it worked, but basically it stopped planes from seeing what was happening inside the valley. It was called Galt's Gulch, after John Galt, one of the main characters of Atlas Shrugged. But this still shows up in the idea of creating uh, islands someplace, uh, Bruce Sterling's islands in the net, data havens in Polynesia, for example, down near Indonesia. And it shows up in people doing seasteading projects that is creating floating platforms, even former World War II gunnery platforms off the coast of England. Uh, a project to move there and create a new nation happened. And I think you're going to hear at this conference about Lieberland or something, somewhere, some island down in the disputed part of uh, the territory near the former Yugoslavia. But to me, the idea of moving to a, a state or a platform or an oil rig or a, even a ship just wasn't very interesting. I like it here in California, despite its problems. And the idea of living in a very uh, attackable region where a single torpedo could send, sink a ship or, or a blockade could stop the flow of supplies into a region was not very appealing. But the idea of moving into cyberspace, this is cyberspace being the idea of William Gibson, a neuromancer, that was very much in the air at the time. Although he sort of postulated this consensual hallucination that, that people, that cyberspace was this uh, semi-drug-induced uh, hallucination. I believed at the time that cryptography te techniques were much more than just about encrypting messages from Alice to Bob, uh, sending a signed and sealed message. That in fact, digital money, remailers, data havens, time stamping services were all very much implementable. So I started, believe it or not, working on a novel I, I had plenty of spare time, and I was sort of interested in combining a modern version of Atlas Shrugged with sort of techno-thriller ideas involving the NSA, uh, arms sales, the, the, the Iran-Contra thing had been big in the news with the CIA selling arms to the, uh, uh, or selling drugs to the, the Contras in South America uh, to make money on a black budget operation to, to implement other projects. Oliver North, all that stuff, at the Point Dexter, very much in the news around 1987-88. So I worked on this novel for a couple of years and it was it was a, a fun time. Every, every morning about this time I would get up and write and write and write. And I initially on, on index cards and I would write plot ideas, I would 
pursue how a data haven could be built, pursue how uh, I had a ten I essentially had a tension between the National Security Agency and a group of uh, essentially libertarian industrialists. This is long before Peter Thiel and his crowd, but I was well familiar with these guys from Intel. I, I worked for a guy named Gordon Moore, Moore's Law, you may have heard of. And uh, it was very much apparent that these techniques, these tools and methods would lead to new generations of technology. So I worked on this for a couple of years intensely, uh, writing it every day, gradually switched over to doing more of my work on a Macintosh. I was, I was a heavy Mac user ever since the early days of, of the Mac, even though I, I'd worked for Intel, which was nominally IBM PCs, but I was much more interested in the Mac interface. Uh, I worked on an AI project, so I used Lisp machines, symbolics, uh, very powerful graphical environments. So I worked on this several years, developing plot lines and developing the tools. I would read academic papers on how time stamping worked, how uh, essentially what we now call distributed ledgers. Uh, two guys from Bell Labs, Haber and Stornetta, had developed a essentially a version of the blockchain based on hashing things. So one could write a song or, or develop a chemical formula and hash it into something that was then printed by, say, the New York Times. This is a very low latency, long latency project. This is on a daily basis. The New York Times would print this hash. Uh, not very long. It would be a set of numbers, obviously. Uh, a number representing more than the number of atoms in the universe. In the known universe could be printed on, on several centimeters of, of text. But the idea being that uh, at some distant point, say five or ten years into the future, one could prove authorship of something by showing that one could generate the proper input to this rolling hash that the New York Times had printed. The idea being that anyone who wanted to uh, fake this, claim that they had written a song in, say, 1990 or 95 or whatever, would have to be able to prove, would have to falsely print out new copies of the New York Times, which might be on microfilm, on CD-ROMs, distributed in tens of thousands of libraries around the world. So this is the idea very similar to Bitcoin, the blockchain, of the fact that a proof of work exists. It's very, very, very difficult to print out all the fake New York Times that have the fake hash that, that a, a, a uh, fraudulent claimant has put into the New York Times. So this is Haber and Stornetta. And I emphasize this very, very much in my 1994 Cybernomicon that, that I we all sensed, a lot of us sensed, that something in proof of work was very critical. Anyway, rolling forward to 1992, a friend of mine, Eric Hughes, who formed Cypherpunks with me, came down to my house here in Santa Cruz, and he was initially looking for an apartment to rent. He was going to go to grad school at the University of California at Santa Cruz. And uh, we ended up talking for four days, Instead of him, instead of uh, him doing research on an apartment, he ended up talking to me for four, four days, and I told him all this exciting stuff. And he had just returned from working for David Chow in Amsterdam for his company, Digicash. It seemed like a rite of passage for several people. Nick Zabel worked for David Chow, Eric Hughes worked for David Chow, and at least two other people. One of uh, one of the remailer developers worked for him. Excuse me. It was very common for uh, uh, people to go work for Chalm's company, Chalm's company in Amsterdam as interns. So Eric had just returned from, from six months working for David. And so he was very much tuned in to, uh, to crypto tools and whatnot. And we talked for several day, days about secure computing, formal methods, proof theory, uh, topology, well, all the stuff that was really cool at that time. And somewhere along the line, I think it was Eric, probably not me, I think it was Eric who said, you know, we know a lot of uh, bright people in the Bay Area. And the Bay Area, even then, was a hotbed of everything from, this is before Burning Man, but it had survival research labs, it had Mondo 2000, 
It had obviously all the Silicon Valley companies at the time. San Francisco was not as important as it is now, but the South Bay certainly is. Uh, Palo Alto, Menlo Park, Mountain View, Santa Clara, San Jose uh, had a huge concentration of interesting people. So Eric, I think it was, suggested that we get together a bunch of the people we knew from various mailing lists and various forums and that we meet at some point. So he was renting a house in Oakland. And uh, in the summer of 1992, about 20 to 25 of us met in his unfurnished house. And we sat on the floor and uh, I gave a pitch for crypto. I published a 60 or 70 page thing, gave handouts to everyone, defining the terms. This is, this is a time when ironically, I knew more about crypto than most of the people in the room did. That pretty much quickly changed as they all got up to speed and became, in some cases, uh, probably one or more of them were the founders of Bitcoin that were in the room at the time. PGP2 had just come out. PGP1 had been sort of a, a disaster, a joke, very primitive, but PGP2 was pretty capable. And a couple of the people who worked on it, I knew pretty well from a mailing list called the Extropians mailing list, which had guys like Hal Finney, uh, Dean Triple, uh, Robin Hansen, who you may have heard, who you may know about from uh, information markets and future markets today. He's a professor. So anyway, we, we, we met all day, all one Saturday, and we talked about ideas, and in the afternoon we played a primitive game called the Crypto Anarchy Game. This is because we had played as, as if we were simulating a war game. We simulated things like anonymous remailers with, by using envelopes within envelopes within envelopes, so people could get a feel for how this might work in a future economy, a future system. And people invented things like uh, weapons trading systems, like drug trading systems, obviously uh, long before Silk Road, uh, the drug trading platform, and information trading platform developed. So we uh, basically played with the ideas and saw what was needed and what happened and uh, what could happen. And people had very interesting ideas, escrow systems, reputation markets, this is the idea that in a future economy of this sort, reputations would matter critically. Uh, pseudonyms would matter. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to use pseudonyms. I, for example, use my real name all the time, but I don't want a government saying I have to use my real name. This is a time-honored tradition, people using pseudonyms. Uh, some of the founding fathers of the United States used uh, pseudonyms in writing. Uh, the early papers defining the theory of, of how the United States would be built. And uh, there are obviously, in many countries in the world, people have to use pseudonyms or they'll be arrested or shot or, 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 or face civil action. So what happened is the, cypher, the, the group that later became, that a couple months later got named Cypherpunks, Eric's girlfriend at the time, basically uh, had a a funny comment. She was working for uh, Mondo 2000, writing articles for them. She wrote an article on our group, and she said at one point, you guys are just a bunch of cypherpunks. This is a, a pun on cyberpunk, obviously. So we used the same, we used the name. Uh, it caught on. A couple people were highly critical of this. They wanted some staid, uh, solid sounding name like the Institute for Cryptographic Research or the uh, Foundational Cryptography Group, blah, 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 blah. But a lot of us like the name Cypherpunks. Uh, I was the oldest, one of the oldest members of the group. And even I didn't mind it. I mean, I don't consider myself very much of a punk. Uh, but the, the term Cypherpunk had already caught on, so Cypherpunk was a nice pun. And ironically, by the way, I should roll this back. Uh, several years earlier, I'd written the Crypto Anarchist Manifesto. And this is also a pun because uh, crypto means hidden, like a crypt, a burial crypt, or cryptozoology, uh, crypto from the Greek word meaning hidden. And uh, people will refer to 
someone else in derogatory terms, uh, like uh, William F. Buckley was once called a crypto-fascist. This is like a hidden fascist. So I thought this was a funny pun because uh, crypto meaning cryptography, which is hidden writing, or cryptology, the study of hidden hidden things. So uh, I'm sure you have a check word that's exactly uh, analogous to crypt. So uh, I, I called this philosophy crypto anarchy because I didn't want to call it anarcho-capitalism, which is the more standard term, or techno-libertarianism, which some people use. And when I dashed off my crypto-anarchist manifesto, it was obviously meant to somewhat remind people of uh, the communist manifesto, even though I'm not a communist. But the idea was uh, to, to generate a one-page summary, and I, I just dashed it off and called it the crypto-anarchist manifesto. Sometimes spelled as one word, sometimes as two words. In the last 20 years, I've been using two, two different words. And it was sort of a pun on, on hidden anarchy and also using cryptography to implement a form of anarcho-capitalism. So anyway, uh, moving back to 1992, we formed a mailing list. John Gilmore, one of the founders of Sun Microsystems, one of the first five employees, that is, offered his his computers up in San Francisco. He had created the alt hierarchy. You may have heard of the alt groups on Usenet, alt.drugs, alt.music, alt.mp3s, alt.whatever. Uh, John had created this, and he'd run it on his own machine without permission from anyone. He just simply created the alt hierarchy. And it happened to propagate a lot of different sites. And in the days when Usenet was big, the old hierarchies were, were where music got distributed, where ideas got distributed, where some of the cold fusion results, putative cold fusion, were, early, were reported earliest in 1989. So John offered to host a mailing list on his machines, and uh, the Cypherpunk's mailing list was formed. This is around September, about the same month we had our first meeting. And it took off like a rocket. We had 100 subscribers within, within the first two weeks. And uh, less than six weeks after the list was formed, Eric Hughes had implemented the first remailer, where one could remail from Alice to Bob to Charles to David, to et cetera, or in any order. Then a few weeks later, Hal Finney in Santa Barbara folded PGP into this so one could encrypt messages within messages within messages. This is much different from the Onion router, Tor, in that this is a system where provably secure operations could happen. One could create, take a whole series of, of, of public keys, Alice, Bob, Charles, etc., in any order, and essentially put one implement, one uh, message inside another message inside another message and all the remailers in the chain would not see anything except the outer address on the envelope when they would open the envelope with their private key and say send this to Dave and then that would go through a series of remailers which could be set one could arrange to have the message go back to one's own remail so if one was worried that all the remailers in the system were controlled by the NSA or the Gestapo or whatnot, one could send it through one's own remailer or any system of these things. And this is an implementation of David Chow's mix system from 1982. We had the first actual implementation. This, these were exciting times. The internet was becoming widely available to people and tools like Perl were being, as primitive as that is, were being used to implement these scripts that do these things. And it was possible then to uh, deploy these systems from a bedroom, from an office. No corporations required. People could just build these things. So the mailing list went on, became very successful. We had 700 people subscribing. We had various people doing the equivalent of the Bitcoin evangelizing, but I was never much into that. Most of us weren't. The people who were excited by this got into it and realized what the possibilities were and started contributing to the list. Some fraction, but maybe 10% were active contributors, and then a lot of hangers on, a lot of people who just read the traffic and didn't do much. But we didn't really have to go out and pass out diskettes or give evangelizing talks about the power of cryptography. This is going to be an important theme. I hope I can get to it later, which is throughout history, 
technologies of what's called disruption, the printing press, the telephone, birth control pills, computer, whatever, have always been run by pull. People wanted to get free music, they wanted to get Napster, they wanted to get copy machines, they wanted to take TV shows on their VCRs. They didn't have to be urged to do this, they didn't have to be pushed. They got pulled in. They could see the power of, of a Xerox machine or a videotape recorder or a computer or writing even. In the early days of the printing press, they could see the power of it. They didn't need to be urged to use it. They just saw it for what it was. And a slogan from the old days of the cyberpunks was William Gibson and, 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 uh, and uh, Bruce Sterling and those guys. I don't know who came up with this, but it's the slogan was, the street will find its own uses for technology. Typically, these are drugs, pornography, uh, free stuff, free music, Napster, BitTorrent, which came out of cypherpunks as well. And basically, people will use the tools for whatever it is they want. Typically, trading music, trading uh, videotapes, Sam's dots in the Soviet Union, people would would use primitive printing techniques to print pamphlets and spread them around. Uh, even today, uh, MP3s in North Korea, for example, the People's Republic of North Korea, people will, will, will use USB sticks to, to transfer songs, text, videotapes, whatever. So the street will find its own uses for technology is very important. And this is in fact what's happened with Bitcoin. People don't need to be urged to use Bitcoin. What, what, it is, what they did is they, they learned enough about Bitcoin to buy and sell stuff on Silk Road and other such forms, Pirate Bay. And this is what they do. I'm not going to moralize whether it's good or bad or, or, or whatnot, but this is historically what people do. So the 1990s was a period of ferment. Uh, lots of new startup companies, lots of new technologies, the spread of the internet to every part of the globe. Uh, and eventually, uh, many of the people in the cypherpunks and other groups moved on to form companies, moved on to create things. One, one friend of mine actually had, had, had a lot of time spent with Elon Musk in the early days of uh, some of his work and uh, probably things like PayPal are a version of digital money. Uh, I, I won't claim that uh, Cypherpunks inspired PayPal, but it started around, around the mid-1990s, along at the same time this stuff was being discussed. So a, an unsolved problem in the, in the mid-90s was digital money. This is the missing piece. We had emailers, we had encryption, we had time stamping services of primitive sorts. But what was missing was a viable digital currency or a cryptocurrency. Chong's company had focused on buyer anonymity. He wanted a system where someone could go into an Aldi's market or a Walmart or whatnot and buy things with the equivalent of cash, meaning a semi-untraceable system. Cash is theoretically traceable. One, with proper scanners, one can trace serial numbers of bills. Uh, but it, in fact, it's impractical to do that, but it's possible. So Chowne wanted a system where, for example, someone driving on a toll road would not be logged as to their identity. He was very big on, a very, on an important idea, which is identification systems that don't require proof of, of personhood. So if one goes into a bar, one maybe needs to prove that one is 21 years old, but one doesn't have to provide identity. So a, a proof of age without a proof of identity works. It, it's ironic. I mean, I've had an expired passport for years, and I was asked to provide identity with my passport. And I said, well, I have this. And they said, but that's expired. And I said, but that doesn't make me any younger than I was. I was, I was X years old when the passport was issued, so I'm still, I'm, I'm at least that old now. And people don't understand that. They think there needs to be an identification card. So Chan was very worried about the fact that in a coming age of, uh, of everybody requiring digital credentials, everything would be tracked. It's so trivial to just log in a driver's license when one enters a bar or buys a, a bottle of liquor or, or cigarettes or whatever. So he wanted identification systems without identity. Uh, 
and you may be familiar with this blinded signatures method. This is like allowing an envelope to have, say, a sliding window that only shows one's age or one's name, but not maybe or just one's age without providing anything more than that, uh, but also non-forgeable. So in, in, in some techniques called zero-knowledge systems, uh, zero-knowledge interactive proof systems, do a lot to solve that problem. But the digital currency problem lingered for a while. Chom's technique, he, he tried to do this company called Digicash, did not work. And in fact, he sought permission from various banking regulators. And a bank in, in the Midwest of the United States called Mark Twain Bank actually partnered with him. This is an important lesson that's going to turn out, that's going to be very critical, which is don't ask permission to do things. The very system we're using right now, Skype, the founder of Skype has said publicly, has written a couple of papers about this, uh, or, or issued manifestos saying if he had gone to regulators and requested a permission to become a telecom supplier, he would have been tied up in paperwork for years and years and years, and probably the regulators and the Congress critters and uh, governments of the world would say, no, we can't allow that. It's like if the inventors of the videotape recorder, VCR, had gone and said, we're proposing a system that allows people to copy television programs. Uh, can we get your permission? It wouldn't have happened. It would have been tied up in, in regulations. So the Skype guy basically just said, hey, it's just a bunch of software. And he didn't even tell people he was trying to create an alternate communications platform. He just did it. And by the time the regulators caught up to it, it was the facts on the ground had already changed. This is an important theme. If you develop something, don't go and ask permission. Don't go to regulators and say, we want to create a blockchain system for the banks. We want to create a uh, Bitcoin timestamping service. We want to uh, create a system for distributing digital music. We want to do a, excuse me, my alarm keeps going off. We want to create a system for uh, distributing music. Well, you're not going to get permission. But it's, by the time you notify regulators and your local governments of what you're planning to do, they'll start doing studies and surveys and starting debating it, and years and years will go by. It's much more important to go plant a flag way out in cyberland, way out beyond the, beyond the frontiers of current knowledge. Just do it. Just You want to create, for example, a database that bypasses the Credit Reporting Act? We, we have this law in the United States saying that you have a right to be forgotten after five years, six years. It sounds great in theory. It's a fundamental violation of, of free speech rights. It says that I, I can be told that I can't remember that someone reneged on their loans seven years ago, six years ago. So one of the earliest things we proposed in cypherpunks were illegal databases. Databases, um, you know, you might have a database consisting of Nazi data on what they did to Jewish prisoners. That's in most countries of the world, that's illegal to actually even do that. Under free speech laws, I mean, that's important, interesting data. It may have been immoral what the Nazis did. I mean, it certainly was immoral. But uh, why should that data not be accessible to researchers? Why should there not be a, a, a method for me to type in someone's name and to see that other people remember that they defaulted on loans five years ago, six years ago? because we have a thing called the Fair Credit Reporting Act that says you must forget that data. You cannot report that data. You cannot have a database on that. Well, obviously people use offshore databases for this. They'll use offshore meaning or in cyberspace. They'll use uh, anonymity based tools for this. This hasn't happened yet to my knowledge, but it's certainly uh, something that's feasible. And it's an example of a data haven application that's going to be coming. The debate on digital currency raged for several years. And this is, these were a series of long, long articles by Hal Finney, Wei Dai up in the Seattle area, Adam Back in uh, England, Cambridge, I think it was at that time. He's now heavily involved in the Blockstream company. Uh, a blockchain-based company. Uh, let's see who I missed. Nick Zabo, who was very interested in smart contracts. He was a member of our group. He actually moved out of the Bay Area from Portland 
to be close to the meetings we used to have uh, once a month. And he's heavily involved, obviously, in, in, in everything connected with smart contracts and distributed autonomous organizations. So people were trying to figure out how to do a truly untraceable, not that Bitcoin is truly untraceable, but it's a, a major step there, as you probably know, as you know. Uh, people were trying to figure out how to solve the, the cryptocurrency problem. And one approach was the proof of work concept. Originally, Adam Back and Hal Finney were heavily in this. And this is the idea of creating a system to fight spam by proving that you've done a certain amount of cryptographic work solving a puzzle and attaching it as a kind of digital postage to your message so that someone would say, well, at least this person sending me the message spent a few, a few dollars worth of, uh, or a few pennies worth of effort to, to encode this message. Uh, so there's several people working on this, Hal Finney, Ray Dye, Adam Back, I'm probably missing a fourth person. Anyway, I can't, I can't remember a whole, but typically there are four people involved, four main people. I think Eric Hughes contributed a lot of this, that what he called an encrypted open books, which is a, a way for businesses to prove that they've done certain things without revealing the details of what they proved. And, and this, by the way, goes back to the issue of what have you got to hide? People say, why use crypto? What have you got to hide? Well, in fact, businesses hide what they're buying as materials, what they're doing in their factories. Individuals don't reveal their preferences. They don't reveal how much they're willing to pay for something, for a car, for example. So people use uh, preference hiding all the time. They have many, many reasons to hide their transactions. So uh, people should never fall for the idea that everything should be written on a postcard. Everything should be in plain text visible. No, in fact, people hide stuff all the time. They hide combinations to their safes. They hide preferences. They, they don't reveal things. They keep secrets all the time. So that's as far as I'm going to say about cypherpunks. It, it basically, the list sort of dissolved in the early 2000s. Many people had gone on to other things. The 9-11 events caused a, a sharp uptick in, in fascist surveillance systems. People were afraid of, of joining groups like the cypherpunks. I actually quit when uh, several of the sites that were distributing the list had folded out of whatever reason, boredom, fear, they moved on. And one of the remaining sites said, I'm going to issue a new site and it's going to be called cypherpunks at alqaeda.net. And my, much as that might be seen as, as hilarious to some, I decided that maybe belonging to a group called alqaeda.net was not the smartest thing to do. And plus, by this time, thing, events have moved on. So in the mid-2000s, around 2006, 2007, uh, a lot of people began revisiting the idea of digital currency. And uh, in 2008, 2009, on the cryptography mailing list, the successor to the cypherpunks mailing list, uh, a guy going by the name, a person going by the name of Satoshi, who you all know about, issued a series of white papers proposing a system which solved the Byzantine general, the Byzantine consensus problem uh, in a novel way, using proof of work, using uh, uh, solving a SHA problem, a SHA-256 hash, and you all know how that works. Miners generate proposed solutions and occasionally they land on, on a, a certain sequence of zeros that's considered a nonce, and this means that they've solved by accident, essentially by brute force, they've solved a particular problem, and they get a reward of some number of bitcoins for this. And the number of bitcoins varies with time, having every, every four years, so that a maximum, as you know, of 21 million Bitcoins, 21 million approximately Bitcoins will ever be issued sometime in the, in the next century with ever increasing amounts of work. So that takes us to the present. Bitcoin took off one of, uh, one of the uh, 
people who worked on this, a guy named Hal Finney, who died several years ago of Lou Gehrig disease, ALS, was one of the first recipients, probably the first recipient of Bitcoins from Satoshi. They set up little set up trial trading programs. And it's unclear whether Hal Finney had anything to do with Bitcoin, but certainly he was the earliest user of, or trader with Satoshi. We don't know who Satoshi is. I, I, I think it's best to just not worry about who it is. It was great the way it came out because he didn't seek regulatory approval. He didn't go to the uh, United Nations or the Federal Trade Commission or anybody and say, I want to build this alternate currency. It was just out there and distributed. And it was too late for anyone else to patent it. I think some people have tried to patent it. An Australian guy named Craig Wright has attempted to patent the idea of Bitcoin. It's not likely to succeed. So this is yet another example where something was just thrust out there into the world and was in widespread use before there was any time to stop it. Uh, where we are today, you, you guys probably know better than I do. You're immersed in this for this conference the last, yesterday and today. You're hearing a lot of these talks. And uh, it's quite clear that things are in ferment right now. The blockchain is a new proposed blockchain company almost every day. I read the Reddit thread on, on proposed startups. A lot of these ideas aren't going to go any place. A lot of these things are not going to get any traction. They're not going to get usage because people aren't going to study the complexities of blockchain. There are companies trying to do things like we, we take the, uh, uh, the euro and divide it by pi and then multiply it by the rolling Fed's discount rate when we sell a contract. And it's, well, most people aren't going to bother with that. I, I didn't even do a very good job of describing these things. But People build these complicated derivatives, these complicated structures. We had a company uh, called Slocket, which basically said, we'll bypass Airbnb by allowing people to, say, rent their house out. And people don't have to go to a real estate agent. They don't have to go to an office. They, they just buy, essentially, access to a digital lock on the door. Well, that sounds great. You know, they disintermediate Airbnb, air bed and breakfast, that's what it's called. It's a, a way of renting uh, places and vacation spots or, or couch surfing. The problem with that is is you, you return to your property, for example, after five people have have slocketed it and you find the place wrecked, the TV stolen, the house wrecked. Who did it? Which of the residents of the last which of the last N residents destroyed your house? What you're not going to disintermediate the need for someone to go in and clean the house and check that things haven't been stolen and whatnot. So Slocket was heavily involved in what was called the, the DAO. They called themselves the DAO, the Distributed Autonomous Organization, which is a concept of creating these autonomous outfits that have uh, smart contracts running on them. And they called themselves the DAO. So I jokingly refer to that whole project as the, the DAO. And the DAO had some weak code written in it. You may have heard about this in June. Basically caused the quote unquote, an erroneous contract which lost them about $60 million. And the DAO in Ethereum, which the DAO runs on, was faced with the tough choice of rewriting the ledger, rewriting history, essentially doing a hard fork which unwound the $60 million quote unquote fraudulent contract, which actually, I have no position morally about this, but it was running legitimate code in the DAO. It's just that the notion that you can write a contract which bypasses lawyers and courts and, and methods of appeal and interpretations of contracts is just a, a silly idea at this point. And this friend of mine, Nick Zabo, the smart contracts guy, uh, certainly generally agrees with us that our legal systems have had centuries to develop and there's there are judges who said, well, that clearly was not, there are judges who will look into the meaning of a contract and say, it was not a, it was not written in good faith that this contract would allow the theft of quote unquote $60 million worth of, of ether tokens in the Dow. So this area is changing very rapidly. Uh, every, like I said, every day, or every day or two, a new uh, 
contract wafts across Reddit, a new proposal to build a new type of system. Most of them haven't gotten that use of this street. Most of them haven't found any compelling reason to learn the details of Ethereum and uh, Solidity, the, the contract writing code, uh, MIST, any of these things. So the, the killer app for Ethereum has not yet appeared. Will Ethereum win out over Bitcoin? I don't know. Bitcoin has the advantage that the interests of, Bit, of the Bitcoin miners and the users are very closely aligned. All it's trying to do is a distributed ledger that, that generates a cryptocurrency. It's not trying to run contracts on it. It's not trying to set up trading platforms. It's not trying to replace the stock market or the, or the Airbnb rental system or hotels or anything of that sort. Uh, the jargon says that Bitcoin is not Turing complete whereas Ethereum is Turing complete. Well, no, no real computers in the real world are Turing complete. A Turing machine requires an infinite tape. All real computers have finite memories, finite this, that, and the other. What people really mean by Turing complete uh, is uh, Zuko Journeyman or Zuko, Bryce Wilcox, the Zcash guy, he says, Turing, what people mean by Turing complete is general purpose. So Ethereum is much more general purpose than Bitcoin is, but it's not yet clear what the killer app for that is going to be. I think the prospects are, are spectacular. We've had a, a lot of successes over the past 30 years. Uh, other people, lots of people have worked on this. Lots of people have, have built companies to do this. And uh, the prospects are very bright. I, uh, there are a lot of things I could say, but I'm running out of time, it, it appears. And uh, so, sorry I didn't have a PowerPoint presentation for you, but I think you're all probably happy that you're not looking at a list of slide, uh, a bunch of slides with uh, bulleted points. I have them, but I'm not sharing them with you. So I think I'll open this up for questions. Uh, if that's okay with you guys, go ahead. Thanks a lot, Tim, for your impressive presentation. Uh, and we have questions. Okay. Can you hear me properly? Can you hear me? I can hear you, yes. Okay, perfect. Yes, I can. Um, so, uh, I think that uh, electronic cash was the last missing piece uh, that wasn't implemented from your crypto anarchist manifesto. Is there something that you think will happen and is missing from the manifesto? So some new type of technology or, uh, or new distributed service that you, know, you didn't see in the um, 90s when you, when you wrote it? Well, I, I was reading uh, uh, through the presentations uh, from other, other people, and someone said, uh, talked about how he doesn't think collapse of governments will occur. That was something I used to put in my SIG, SIG thing, where I summarized a lot of, uh, a lot of the points, uh, black markets, remailers, digital currency, uh, collapse of governments. Well, that really wasn't a prediction so, so much as a, as a statement of what you guys here are talking about, which is parallel, parallel organizations, which I think we're seeing. Uh, we've always had these things. We've, we had churches going back a thousand years or more, uh, which were essentially super governments. They, they crossed national borders, the Catholic Church, obviously the Reformation. We've always had what are called invisible colleges. There's groups of people, scholars, religious organizations who, who essentially transcend national borders. I think that's what's happening. And arguably, we've seen a lot of governments collapse, in the Middle East especially, as the U.S. goes in, the United States goes in and implements regime change to replace the dictator in Iraq. And now we have chaos in Iraq, the dictator in Libya. Now we have chaos in Libya, the dictator in, in Syria, and now we're destroying the country of Syria as we replace the evil dictator of Assad, we're trying to. 
So we've, we've, we've had a lot of collapses of governments. We've had, whether the U.S. government collapses, I don't know, uh, depends. It's, uh, many of the goals felt on the verge of, of uh, disaster economically in other ways. So I'd say that the political implications have not yet occurred, which is fine. Uh, a meta theme I want to, that always drove on cypherpunks is uh, the idea of cypherpunks write code. We had a lot of people in the cypherpunks drift who were lefty, right wingers. We probably had more left wing leaning people initially. And gradually they shift, they, they learn more and more about free markets and anarcho capitalism. And they realize that fighting their battles for George McGovern or uh, John Kerry or Bill Clinton weren't all that useful. It was interesting that during the time when cypherpunks was most active, you know, with the clipper chip and whatnot, a democratic regime was in power in Washington as Bill Clinton, and he was pushing for the clipper chip, which was a key escrow sort of system, which happened, I didn't even mention this in the history of things, but this happened just as cypherpunks was getting rolling. A lot of things were happening as we got rolling. The Wired magazine had just started publication. The clipper chip was being proposed to put uh, inside telephones. I, I coined a term called Big Brother Inside. Since I'd worked for Intel, and Intel had this little logo that said Intel Inside. I grew, drew up on one of the bulletin boards, Big Brother Inside. And somebody out there got a, got a printing company to print a bunch of these stickers that said they had the little Intel logo with Big Brother Inside. And some people went inside retail stores, Buys and Best Buy and whatnot, and whatever versions you may have over in Europe, and put these things on telephone systems surreptitiously uh, on, the, on display. These phones didn't actually have the clipper chip inside, but the clipper chip sank when uh, failed pretty badly when one of our members, uh, Matt Blaze, uh, a researcher on the East Coast of the United States, I guess he was at Bell Labs at the time, uh, he actually proved that the key as the law enforcement access field, the leaf field, was flawed. And he found a way to reverse engineer the, the clipper chip, the Microtronics chip, which made it fail. At the same time, uh, a bunch of cypherpunks got around the export laws by exporting to Europe, namely you know, the, the Hackers Conference uh, that you guys have in Germany and whatnot every year. They, act, they exported RSA, by, or PGP, actually by printing out PGP in text form, and this could be freely transported. The United States has fairly strong laws, uh, the First Amendment basically stopping almost all forms of halting publication of something. So the export people wouldn't allow software to be exported, but a printed text that could then be scanned in on the European side. Now, I don't think, I don't know that anybody did this, but the, but the principle was they printed out PGP in a font that was extremely easy to uh, scan, optical character recognition, and convert to code. And uh, between that and the failure of the, of the law enforcement access field, the leaf field, the whole clipper and key escrow thing is dead. And the prosecution of Phil Zimmerman for violating the International Traffic and Arms Regulation, uh, ITAR, for violating munitions, for, for exporting munitions, crypto as soon as a munition like a bomb or a plane or whatnot. That pretty much ended, and by around 1996, all efforts to, to, to build key escrow into cryptographic codes ended. Some people think it's coming back, but pretty much the horse is out of the barn at this point. All these schools are out there that, I mean, everything you see all around you, it's, it's pretty much too late. Britain is talking about outlawing cryptography that it can't access. Uh, I think that's unlikely to succeed. Uh, certain senators of the United States want to bring this back. The FBI is worried about the so-called going dark, that they, they can't access things like cell phones, uh, which are very strong. What did we have? A friend of mine, uh, Moxie Marlin Spike, has a pro has a cool called Signal, and versions of this have, have appeared in uh, WhatsApp, Twitter, I think, I think, I'm not sure, I don't use Twitter or Facebook or any of these social media crap sites. 
but I but it's pretty widely available. I have Signal running on this iPhone. I don't use it much because, frankly, unless you're running Silk Road or, or or actually a spy, most people don't usually typically use it. Uh, although that's not to say that the government should be out of the ban. Next question. Next question. Uh, if you, I don't know if you want to talk about it, but uh, do you remember how or who gave you your first Bitcoin, if you have one? I've never bought a Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a, I'm a big believer in not complicating my life by, by using things that I don't see a use case for. Uh, it's like Phil Zimmerman who says he doesn't use PGP anymore because it's, there's a lot of key management stuff, a lot of stuff, and he says he's lost contacts. Friends of his who say, well, you have to use Bitcoin. It's the old, you have to eat your own dog food. Or, your, excuse me, you have to use PGP. So I, I probably bought $200 worth of, of PGP programs from PGP Corporation, which would come out with a new version. I'd upgrade my version. It would then break. It wouldn't work under OS X for the Mac. Then I'd buy the upgrade. Then six months later, it stopped working. Then I'd then a friend of mine who worked for PGP Corp would do a bootleg copy he says, here, he says, I know the hassle you're going through. We're going through the same thing. Everything breaks. It runs for a few months, then it breaks. It runs for a few months, then it breaks. Meaning break, meaning doesn't get supported by new OS upgrades for Windows or Macs. And eventually, uh, most of us just stopped using it. I mean, uh, we use crypto all the time in our, in our uh, SSL connections in... Uh, forward secrecy, phone calls, FaceTime, for example. We're not using that right now, we're using Skype, but FaceTime is forward secrecy, meaning a call from Alex to Bob is, is forward secrecy encrypted, meaning Apple doesn't have the key, uh, and the key is destroyed once the call is complete. The key is no longer used. So perfect forward secrecy is widely, widely distributed now. Governments around the world are freaking out over this because they can't, they can't get court orders to open it. It's uh, like the printing press, the copy machine, birth control pills, Xerox machine, everything. It has, there are good uses and bad uses and nefarious uses and honest uses, uses by freedom fighters around the world. I mean, I did a thing in one of the few talks I've given, one was in 1997 in the Electronic Frontiers Foundation, and I listed enemies of, of the population, and I mostly concentrated on the United States. I concentrated on all the people who've been enemies, like the Mormons, the, uh, the Latter-day Saints. They were prosecuted in the state of Missouri. Uh, people who buy and sell birth control information in many countries in the world, Ireland even. It was illegal until recently to distribute birth control information. It may still be illegal to buy and sell contraceptives in, in, in stores. I don't know the details, but many places have had people that we would consider not nefarious, not traitors, not spies, not mass murderers, who are nevertheless treated as enemies of people who have to keep their communication secure. Obviously, in many uh, countries of the world, distributing Christian propaganda is illegal. Distributing Muslim propaganda may be illegal in other places, and so on. Sorry to be so long-winded. Uh, I have another question. So more than 20 years ago, you also coined the term and you predicted uh, four horsemen of digital info, info apocalypse. Unfortunately, all these predictions happened and they are valid. So my question is, uh, can you make another prediction how government can in the future significantly restrict our freedoms, our liberty? Well, it was, it was pretty obvious. I mean, I mean when, you know the four horsemen of the apocalypse from the Bible. So the four horsemen of the apocalypse was the idea that the, 
people would always say money launderers, porno child pornographers, uh, drug sellers, counterfeiters, you name it. I mean, there were always going to be a list of the people who were subverting society. And, and the, the four I named were the most obvious ones. Uh, uh, people who use the internet or computers or photography to distribute child pornography or distribute drugs or uh, uh, cut or violent code copyrights, etc., etc. Uh, well, copyrights on books and use it. That's not considered one of the, the worst users, but you get the idea. Uh, at this point, I would say that they're not doing much. I would say governments of the world are, are pretty much flat-footed. And one of the most interesting things to do is, to, is, is, is if you have an idea for a new tool, uh, and I, I can't even begin to think what that might be, but if you have an idea for a new tool, just go ahead and distribute it. Go ahead and get it widely distributed. Plant a flag way out in, in the frontier uh, where, they, where, where governments of the world haven't even thought about responding to it. And certainly never, ever, ever go to your local politicians and say, I'm thinking of doing a system, I call it digital data whackery. And it's a blah, 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 does this, that, and the other. And they, and they say, okay, well, we'll ignore you for now. And then one of their staffers says, okay, we'll start researching this. And then it wends its way through through years and years and eventually gets outlawed or banned. Realize what Skype did, what PayPal did, what uh, Airbnb did, what Uber did, uh, or Lyft. Simply build, throw it up against the wall, see what sticks. This uh, is a technique that uh, I mentioned Autodesk, the company that did AutoCAD. John Walker, who I think lives in Switzerland now, has for many years. Basically, they started with six or seven ideas. They were up in Marin County, north of San Francisco. And they did six or seven ideas, and the idea was to see which one stuck. They threw it against the wall, and some ideas stuck. And the one that stuck for them was a digital CAD system that could be used on, on PCs, and this is AutoCAD. We're in an exciting time right now with uh, Ethereum, Bitcoin, distributed autonomous organizations, and that people can literally, with a two-man crew, uh, uh, they don't even need a full web stack, a full uh, stack of applications uh, in, involving the LAMP uh, layers. They can just write a proposal, code in Solidity or, or, or one of the other programs that Ethereum is using and try it out. So far, I haven't seen anything that's really compelling to use. I don't, I don't use Ethereum. I don't see anything uh, in my house that needs that. Uh, I have access to free books and free music through a variety of worldwide sites. You probably know about the site in uh, Russia. Library Genesis or LibGen. You know, probably know about the woman in Kazakhstan who basically has as her mission to make available nearly every scientific paper ever published. And if she doesn't have it on one of her systems, people scan it in and send it to her system. Uh, I forget the name of it, but it basically has PDFs of almost every paper published. Friends of mine who write books, academic books, and papers basically are sympathetic to this. They get no money from the publishers. I, I don't want LCBA, LCBA uh, to come after me by editing. Basically, they charge the authors money, their institutions, to publish their scientific papers, and then the authors get no money from this. But LCBA will charge a library tens of thousands of dollars for a, a set, for a set of subscriptions to, to their scientific papers. And it's a, it's a system that's being broken down right now by this worldwide consortium of people distributing books and papers on the PDF form. And uh, I, I basically, almost any, I went through a phase where I bought virtually every math textbook out there on topology, algebraic, topology, algebraic geometry, I was, after cypherpunks, I, I got heavily involved in, in category theory and uh, the math of category theory and whatnot, Haskell, the programming language. And uh, 
So it's a great development, the widespread availability of, of papers. Uh, that's what I would predict is going to happen. The end of the end of copyright, the end of of, of formal book publishing as it happens. In, in, in many ways, this is already happening. Many, many bookstores in my area have closed. National chains like Borders went out of business. We happen to have a very good bookstore here in Santa Cruz, Bookshop Santa Cruz. But most of the great bookshops over in the Bay Area, in Berkeley and San Francisco, are gone. They're, they're wiped out. And even the little bookstores, which used to exist, they got merged in the, the Walden Books and B. Dalton. These are two brands that used to have tens of thousands of stores in the United States. They were little stores, little storefronts, and they got swept up in the big creation of, of things like uh, Borders, the big giant mega bookstore chain. And then Borders went out of business. And in many places in the Bay Area, there were no bookstores at all. No little ones, no big ones. And, and people aren't reading books. Thanks a lot. And uh, we have uh, the final question. Uh, hi, Tim. Okay. Uh, if you could move hi. the time back, uh, so to the history when you started CypherFunds, uh, is there any topic that you listed during this nice talk that you sort of regret you didn't elaborate further or that would become your next big thing or something like that? What would that be? I think digital currency, of some form, we spent a lot of time, I was not one of the main participants, I, I contributed ideas, I, I talked about the time stamping stuff that Habern's Tocometa developed, but we didn't really quite know what the pieces were, and it took the genius of Satoshi, whoever he was, and he may have been one of these, one of these four people I've mentioned, or he may be someone else, but he certainly took he or, or the group took a bunch of the ideas being talked about and by 2008-2009 deployed Bitcoin. And it, like I said, it closely aligned with the with the, uh, the greed interests of individual miners doing this money. And there's very little mechanism for them to violate the terms of the consensus agreement. So it solved, in a market sense, what's called the Byzantine generals problem. You, you undoubtedly know about this, you know, four, four generals, and several generals are considering attacking the city and they say, we'll attack at 8 a.m. But then someone, how do you know that they got the message? How do you know that they're not defecting? So uh, the solution that Satoshi proposed is a market-oriented approach, something Hayek and, and, and uh, Rothbard and uh, those people would certainly have appreciated, which is a, a system for building for for building on consensus based on simple greed, on the fact that it's very expensive to fake a result. I, I think I think we could have done a version of Bitcoin ten years earlier if people had had the right ideas, and uh, certainly. What was exciting about cypherpunks is this is a very long form uh, essay system. People will write long emails and long analyses, white papers. Nope. Damn, alarm keeps going off. Uh, this is quite different from today's Reddit or tweet society where people are writing one line repartee. I'm personally not a fan of that. I'm not a fan of, of joking repartee, one liners and short tweets that fit into 40 characters or less. I don't think that's a way to, to think about things in detail. When I was first getting started on this in 87, 88, for example, I, I spent four days trying to understand the dining cryptographers network that Chowman proposed. This is a system where uh, quite, quite interesting. It hasn't really been deployed. Some of the new zero knowledge systems use versions of the dining cryptographers net or DC net. Some people say it's named David Chown, DC, but he called it dining cryptographers, related to what's called the dining philosophers problem uh, in consensus. So in, in answer to that question, I would say there's nothing I regret about what happened. It all unfolded organically and uh, in due time. Uh, of the 700 members of the list, I would say maybe 30 people were very active on the list. 
and of those, maybe 10 people were, were creating pioneering new ideas, and that was enough to get things done. That's all I have to say about that. Okay, thank you a lot, Tim. Uh, thank you for your comprehensive uh, answer, answers and your presentation. Uh, we are really, really happy that you could uh, make this uh, talk, this Skype talk. Uh, we are sending you uh, happy greets from Institute of Crypto Anarchy. <laughs> uh, so thank, thank you a lot.